Before we begin, I would like to make a correction. This video was filmed quite a while ago, and I was too lazy to re-record it. The fact is, the device from Fluke featured in this video was created in the early 90s of the last century. However, the video mentions the 70s, but, in reality, these devices were produced with almost no significant changes. Since the 70s, it's just that my sample is from the 90s. Well now, enjoy the video. Hello everyone. I know many of you love Soviet technology, particularly electronics. In fact, the Soviets made very serious measuring equipment that many of us have never even heard of. And all of this was based on their own components. Nevertheless, we lack behind the West in this regard, especially in terms of digital measuring instruments. A few years ago, I made a review of a very interesting Soviet digital multimeter called Electronica MMC-1. You can watch the mentioned video via the link in the description. I have several of these devices, and quite some time ago, I acquired another similar multimeter, and it's completely new straight from storage. This device was purchased not just for the sake of it, but to pit it head-to-head -head against its direct American competitor, the 8020 from the legendary Fluke. But before that, let me tell you a little about these devices. According to my information, Electronica was produced from the mid-1980s. Country of origin are, this sample is from 1992, and technically the Soviets were no longer around. But it doesn't matter a year earlier, or later doesn't make a difference. The prices of such devices varied. It all depended on the production date, but the average cost was comparable to the average monthly salary of an industrial worker and was around 100 to 120 Soviet rubles. And naturally, only a select few could afford such a device at that time. The device is simple. It runs on a 9-volt battery of the 6F22 standard, or as we call it, Krona. The weight with the battery is about 350 grams. The meters and ranges are switched in an unusual way. They are set by different combinations of switches on the left. It's not very convenient, but you can get used to it quickly. It has a power switch. There is no auto-off feature. A liquid crystal display, three and a half digits for input terminals and a stand. It can measure direct voltage up to 1000 volts with an average tolerance of 0.2% and alternating current up to 750 volts with the frequency of the measured voltage ranging from 40 Hz to 1 kHz with a tolerance of 1.2%. Resistance up to 20 megaohms, 0.2%. Direct current up to 10 amperes with a tolerance of 1% and in the range up to 1 ampere, only 0.2%. And alternating current up to 10 amperes with a tolerance of 1% in the range up to 1 ampere, and up to 2% in the range from 1 to 10 amperes. The casing is plastic, and the main inscriptions are made on an aluminum plate. If anything, they do not wear off over time. We'll study the internals later and compare them with the American. Now let's take a look at that American, the opponent of our electronics, the Fluke 8020B. Multimeters from the 80 series were the first digital multimeters. They were manufactured since the 1970s. This particular sample was released in the early 1980s. Among them were True RMS multimeters, made in America by the Fluke Company, founded by John Fluke in 1948. The device is powered by the same 9 volt battery. There's a power switch on the side. On the other side, it has a connector for an external power supply. The numbers and overall display are smaller than those of the Electronica, also with three and a half digits. There are three input terminals at the bottom. The stand is plastic, made more sturdily compared to the Electronica. The labels on the front panel are colored, made on self-adhesive material, and have not worn off over all this time. Most of the labels on the back are embossed and are of very high quality. It is capable of measuring direct voltage up to 1000 volts with an average tolerance of 0.1% and alternating current up to 750 volts with a tolerance of 1%. It can actually measure the root mean square value of voltage in circuits up to 5 kHz. Direct current up to 2 amperes with a tolerance of 0.75%. Alternating current also up to 2 amperes with a tolerance of 1.5%. Resistance up to 20 megaohms. In the main range from 200 ohms to 200 kilohms, the error is only 0.1%. There is a voltage drop meter on the PN junction, just like in the Electronica, and also a super fast continuity tester, which is absent in the Electronica. Additionally, the Fluke is capable of measuring conductance, 
the inverse of resistance measured in Siemens. With conversion to resistance, this device can actually measure tens of gigams. To be fair, the 8020B was quite an advanced device by those standards, but there were others in this line. For example, the 8022, which did not have the continuity and conductance measurement functions, or simplified models with the index. So there were models functionally similar to our electronica. Therefore, we will not take the previously mentioned two functions into account. Before starting the test, it's important to know and understand that then and now Fluke has been and remains a leading global brand producing measurement equipment. It has always been respected and renowned for the high safety and accuracy of its equipment. Even devices made 30, 40 years ago still give modern mid-range and high-end multimeters a run for their money. Fluke exclusively produces professional industrial grade equipment. In other words, they don't have the concept of a cheap multimeter for beginners. They are designed to work in the harshest conditions, have numerous input protections, and are resistant to mechanical damage. Another free endorsement of Fluke products. Between us, they won't even say thank you for this. In general, let's move on to the tests. For most measurements, our benchmark will be a professional multimeter, the Fluke 289 Industrial Grade Data Logger, which costs about as much as a week's vacation in the Maldives, or slightly less. It has a much higher accuracy in all measurements compared to the devices being tested. It should also be noted that the test multimeters have factory calibration and have not undergone verification. Electronica is 100%, but I'm not sure about the Fluke since I'm not its first owner and it didn't have the appropriate stickers or documents. Let's start with direct voltage. Didn't expect, right, that the electronics would be no worse than Fluke, but the fact is clear. I see voltage sine wave at 50 Hz. I see voltage sine wave at 500 Hz. I see voltage sine wave at 1 kHz. See voltage sine wave at 5 kHz. Here, too, everything is fine with the electronics, as long as the frequencies are not above 1 kHz. Direct current. The electronics again do not fall short. Alternating current. Here the electronics perform a little worse, but not by much. Resistance. Meter. We have this kind of box, inside which are hidden ultra-precise and ultra-stable resistors. The first reference resistance is 10 ohms. Flu. Electronics MMC01. 263.0. 77 ohms, 1 kilohm, 10 kilohms, 180 kilohms, 10 megohms. Voltage drop meter on PN junctions. In this mode, the voltage on the output probes of the electronics is about 2.5 volts. And interestingly, the Fluke has exactly the same voltage. Both devices can test all types of diodes and many LEDs. They also illuminate white ones but do not show the voltage drop. The current consumption of the devices themselves when measuring DC voltage in the same range is over 7 milliamps for the electronics and only 1.7 milliamps for the fluke. That means the battery in the electronics will discharge several times faster than in the American one. And you can also check out the ultra-fast continuity test of the fluke. There is no delay in activation or deactivation. Display. Here the Fluke definitely leads despite having a smaller display. Firstly, the contrast readability and viewing angles are much better than those of the electronics. Additionally, it is positioned at an angle. It always faces the operator during work, whereas the electronics seem to always face upwards. Casings. The Fluke's casing is significantly thicker and sturdier. It doesn't creak or have any play, despite its age and the fact that it has been actively used. The casting is quite interesting and textured. 
As for the electronics casing, what can I say? I think many of you are familiar with plastic products made in the USSR. It's the same here. So what now? It's time to get inside. And let's start with the American one. After opening it up, the first thing that catches the eye is the laminated metal shield of the main board. This means the multimeter is protected from various electromagnetic interferences. There is the possibility to calibrate current and voltage. After removing the shield, the motherboard is revealed to us. There is also a small board with a couple of microchips and a buzzer. The main board, despite its age, is in excellent condition. The soldering is high quality, shining like it did on the first day. Not a hint of ring cracks. I look at this board and admire the fact that it was designed manually many decades ago and designed competently. Back then, engineers didn't have tools like LTM Designer. LTM is a program that can bring all your electronic design fantasies to life. It's a powerful tool used by top companies for developing the most complex electronics and by engineers worldwide. With this tool, you can design electronic circuits of any complexity, create printed circuit boards for them, simulate their operation and see in 3D how your board will look. In addition to all this, there's a huge database of components to suit any taste. Ltium is in demand and popular worldwide, not just Another simple editor, but a professional tool for developers of all kinds. Through the link in the description, my subscribers can purchase the program with a 25% discount. The fuse here is from Busman. It's an expensive explosion-proof, fast-acting fuse. Similar ones are still used in fluke products. Another fuse, although not as cool, is located on the other side. The input circuits of the device are equipped with several protections. There is a potted shunt, and a bit further are precision input dividers in the form of an assembly on a ceramic base. All components are through hole. The board is from the early 1980s. A bit further, we see a tiny component marked 589. This is nothing other than a stable solid state reference voltage source AD589, or simply a Zener diode, at 1.2 volts, but not an ordinary one. Firstly, it is very low power and very stable. The temperature drift is 50 ppm per degree Celsius, and the noise is 5 microvolts RMS. Of course, it cannot be compared to the ultra-precise and super-stable LTZ-1000, which for the past 35 years has been the king of solid-state references and has a temperature drift of only 0.05% per degree Celsius. But for a portable multimeter from 40 years ago, this is a very, very respectable reference. The analog to digital converter of the device is hidden under the display module. There is a chip marked 429,100 from Intersil. This is almost analogous to the famous ICL 7106, which is used in many multimeters even today. But the Fluke chip has some differences. In total, there are at least five chips here, mostly logic and operational amplifiers. There is even a dual operational amplifier with a field effect input. You can find technical documentation for the multimeter and study everything in detail. Overall, regarding the layout and execution, I can say that components from reputable brands are used here. The soldering is high quality, the input circuit protections are good, the reference source is excellent, and everything is thought out to the smallest detail. Every slot, every hole has its purpose. You won't see any floppy work, modifications, or reworks here, as this was the best technology of its time. Now let's open up our electronics. I will note once again, the electronics are brand new and have never been opened before. The seal with the quality control acceptance stamp doesn't lie. In general, we will be the first ones to have been here in 30 years. We don't have any shielding, but that's a minor issue. Who cares about interference? The board is double-sided, just like Fluke, but there's no solder mask here. There's no lacquer on the board either, and that's strange because the boards of two other similar devices were abundantly coated with lacquer. There are also many trimmer resistors, a solid metal shunt. On the reverse side of the board, there are a couple of microassemblies. One of them consists of resistors connected in series, used as input dividers. 
The other piece is a high precision shunt made of resistors on a single substrate. P2K switches with a bunch of wires, flags, and electrolytes. The ADC here, like in the Fluke, is hidden under the display module. It's a KR572PW5 and is a direct analog of the ICL7106. There are many similar circuit solutions, but there are also quite a few differences. The electronics are implemented in a more complex way, clearly lacking in input protection and the quality of the printed circuit board. Fluke has higher repairability. On the positive side, the electronics can measure current up to 10 amperes, which is beyond Fluke's capability. Conclusions As we can see, our MMC01 electronics outperforms the American Fluke in all parameters. I wish I could say that, but alas, the electronics, undoubtedly, in terms of accuracy in many ranges, is not inferior to Fluke, and in some areas even leads. But Fluke is 10 years older and used. Also, in terms of assembly, the device from Fluke definitely takes the lead. The results were clear to me from the very first day I saw them, but nevertheless, I think the video turned out to be interesting. I tried to make an unbiased review, but nonetheless, the electronics are more appealing to me because they are ours. Upon studying both of these multimeters in more detail, I concluded that the electronics were not a complete copy of the Fluke as I previously saw it. Undoubtedly, some technical control solutions and so on are borrowed from Fluke, but there is a lot of originality in the electronics. In some places it's better, in others worse, but there isn't a single foreign component in it. Nowadays, no manufacturer from post-Soviet countries can do without foreign components. The production of microelectronics is absent in most countries of the former Union, and in those where it exists, it is stuck somewhere in the 90s. Somewhere over there, in distant Taiwan, they will soon launch the production of chips with a tuninometer process, and we are still making transistors, like these. Someone might argue, but we do, produce chips. Yes, we do, but they are clearly outdated by 20 or 30 years. I absolutely do not want to discredit post-Soviet production. On the contrary, I highly value the efforts of our engineers who go above and beyond. But there are too many open questions and problems. And this is not the fault of those engineers. Well, friends, this video has come to an end. A full review of the MMC-01 Electronics, the Super Cool Military Fluke 27FM, and many other retro tech reviews can be found in the corresponding playlist via the link in the description. Rate this video with a like or dislike, although the dislikes aren't visible anyway. And if you have time, subscribe to my other channels where videos are published regularly. That's all from me. Wishing everyone peace and kindness. And as always, this was Kazyanov Ka with you. And until next time, goodbye.